happy Friday morning to you, 9.06. We've got a fast-moving show today, and we are going to be all over the place. In just a moment, your opportunity to ask an atheist. We've got the director of the Society of Edmonton Atheists, Luke Fevin, in the house. We'll get to him in just a moment after the 9.30 news. Dr. Mark Urema joins us. He's an ER doctor. We're going to talk about the fentanyl deaths on the rise in Alberta. The numbers are striking. They're startling. You need to know what you need to know about on this one. Trust us because it's hitting some people that least expect it. The 10 o'clock hour is going to pack a punch. Emmanuel Jal joins us. He was a former child soldier in South Sudan turned activist. He is making waves around the world with the impact of his story. He's collaborating with some of the biggest names in music. He'll join us live in studio. Tony Batista from the Conference of Defense Associations Institute joining us as well to talk about Prime Minister Harper and the plan to expand the mission against the Islamic State and then a wildly entertaining roundtable in store in the 11 o'clock hour. Jenny Adams, Randy Brzozowski will join us. But first, Luke Fevin, welcome to the show. Good morning. I've already got a couple of emails from listeners who know that you're coming in. And let me start with this one. I'm sure it's no surprise to you, Luke, that your perspective can be polarizing. And I've got an email here from Jonathan who says, I understand Mr. Fevin will be on your show this morning discussing, among other things, the Society of Edmonton Atheists bus advertising campaign. Says Jonathan, as a Christian, I'm quite happy that the Society of Edmonton Atheists is raising awareness about such topics. An ad campaign like this, like the one that says, Godless, good, is bound to generate conversations, which simply creates more opportunities for us Christians to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love it whenever I have the chance to discuss the truth of Christianity, and even more so when others are willing to initiate the conversation. It makes it so much easier to share the truth and love of God. Please pass along my thanks to the Society and to Luke personally for investing their money in something that will increase the spread of the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. From Jonathan, have a blessed day. Well, that's very kind of you, Jonathan. Thanks. It's working. The bus ads that you took out are getting people talking. You know, uh, Jonathan and I actually agree on most of what he said, uh, and that is that... It is better that we be in conversation about this. You know, religion is is one of those tricky conversations that we're not supposed to talk about. Uh, and in fact, we think it's the other way. We think it's it's better that we we talk about this. Uh, that religion is a conversation we feel comfortable discussing, and that all perspectives are welcome. Luke, what is atheism all about? Because I know that even right off the bat, we're probably going to have to discern between an atheist and an agnostic. Yes. Atheism is simply the position or a conclusion uh, that there are no gods. Zero. That's it. Period. Uh, And of course, the interesting thing is most people are atheists about most gods. Um, You know, even if you hold that the Christian God is is true, um, then you still don't believe in Thor or Zeus or Apollo or, you know, any one of a, a thousand gods. So we're all atheists. Um, it is the contention of, of the Society of Edmonton Atheists that perhaps we're just atheist about one more. Now, you know that some people, uh, those that haven't turned off their radios, <laughs> some people are right now pitying you because they believe that you will burn in hell. Yeah, and, and, and that's okay. Uh, no one's trying to change anyone else's mind here. Uh, in fact, really, uh, as an atheist, we feel that uh, we're coming from behind in some respects in trying to have people understand what atheism is and isn't. So uh, atheism is simply a conclusion that there are no gods. Uh, agnosticism uh, is not a claim um, to... Uh, it is not a conclusion. It is a strength of uh, claim to knowledge. So if I was a Gnostic atheist, I would be absolutely 100% convinced that there were no gods. Uh, And as an agnostic atheist, uh, I accept that I cannot know anything for sure. Uh, And so personally, and most of the atheists I know are actually agnostic atheists. In the same way, we have agnostic theists and Gnostic theists. Uh, That only refers to the strength of your conviction. I'm going to read a text message here, and and this uh, segment is titled Ask an Atheist, because that's exactly what we invite you to do. You can text us at 630-630. Lyle says, please ask this fellow if he's ever looked into the nighttime sky on a clear night by design 
or chance. In other words, and this goes, I would imagine, what Lyle's getting at is to this bigger argument, this bigger conversation of the wonder of the solar system, the human brain, the iris in the eye, the cardiovascular system. How can this happen by rocks colliding billions of years ago? There must be a god is the conclusion that many will make. Well, absolutely. And, you know, we all wonder whether we believe in a god or whether we don't believe in a god. No one looks at the night sky, I think, without absolute awe or wonder. Um, but the question is, what do you fill that gap in knowledge with? Um, do you take what is uh, what I feel the, the brave and the intellectually honest approach of going, I don't know? Uh, or uh, do we kind of cram some kind of, uh, some kind of ready-made answer? Uh, and I think from an atheist position, you know, the, that uh, a lot of the faith stories are, are really just old superstitions that we cram into things that we can't yet explain. Now, I'm going to ask you about this bus campaign and just and why you feel prompted to reach out to people to advertise your society. People can learn more at edmontonatheist.ca. But first of all, the context of how this interview right here came about. You were tuned into the show yesterday. We were talking about race relations in Canada. We were talking about uh, Muslim, uh, either cultural or religious wear, uh, the hijab, the niqab, the burqa. And then the conversation evolved into talking about Christmas pageants and the like. Is that you, th That's right around the time that you reached out to us. What prompted you reaching out to us? Well, the conversation yesterday was brilliant from from all sides. Uh, uh, certainly, the one surrounding uh, the niqab and charter rights, uh, because if you're an atheist, you are you are certainly uh, likely to be very pro uh, religious freedom. Um, but at the same time, well, wait wait a second. Yeah. Okay. What do you mean? Well, you, you can't have freedom from religion uh, without embracing freedom of religion. Uh, and uh, by the same token, you can't have freedom of religion without respecting freedom from religion. And uh, so, you know, th those two go hand, hand in hand. Um, and so that, that was the niqab situation. Now, uh, s education and religion and education is kind of a specialist subject of mine. And so when you wandered into how do we deal with the cultural historicity of Christmas uh, with uh, public schools that are meant to serve everybody and respect everybody. And that to me is a really interesting conversation. And um, there is no black and white here. This is a gray area and it's a moving bus. And, you know, we all have to kind of walk together a little bit on this one. But my, my personal take, and I, I don't speak for the society when I say this, uh, but my personal take is um, the, the dividing line in a public school with Christmas is if you are doing it as a tip of the hat to culture, um, then absolutely there is a place for Silent Night and other such things in a, in a Christmas pageant. Uh, at the same time, um, if you're actually uh, getting people to pray and you are pushing Christmas as a literal truth to children, then you've overstepped the, uh, the mark in a public school. Okay, so paint me a hypothetical scenario of what a, let's say, a grade four classroom should look like in the month of December. And I'm talking about the involvement of students. I'm talking about what the teacher's talking about, what the decor looks like, what days off people get. Um, well, I, again, in, in the same way that we had the conversation yesterday about the niqab transcending um, being a cultural tradition into becoming a religious requirement, uh, because, of course, it, it is not literally a religious requirement, but it has become one. Um, in, the, in the same way, we have, to, we have to transcend that line with Christmas. Um, let's have Christmas in the classroom, um, discussed, as um, as something that is a cultural tradition and allow those that want it to be a truth to take it to that next level themselves. Here's where I think we ran into the wall yesterday, though, when you start talking about cultural traditions in a multicultural country like Canada, you're going to immediately raise the ire of some people who would suggest that I'm a Canadian, I was born here, but Christmas has nothing to do with my culture. Yes. And they would be, and they would be completely right. So, um, it, would the true atheist perspective be to eliminate all sort of cultural celebrations or observances that would have any ties to any 
faith-based mantra or any faith-based perspective and just get rid of them for good? Um, firstly, you, you bring up a, a good distinction. So as an atheist, I, I simply don't believe there are gods and my atheism doesn't take me anywhere else. As a secularist, I do believe that the public sphere should be devoid of um, uh, religious privilege in certain areas or that the government shouldn't be involved in religion. Uh, so, no, no no one's trying to get rid of religion. And in fact, I think this is a misnomer out there. No one's trying to get rid of it. Uh, what, what has happened is uh, Christianity in particular has been privileged in this country for 100 years. Uh, but what we're seeing is that there is a rollback on that privilege towards equality. And that, that rollback of privilege is hurting some Christians. And I understand why. They've got a privilege, and it's slowly being eroded. I don't think anyone would, would, <laughs> would not understand why that wouldn't be painful. But the point is, eventually, we have to get to a place of equality. We've got a ton of text messages backing up. I have to fit in one quick break, so we'll do that right now. When we come back, Ask an Atheist continues with Luke Fevin, the director of the Society of Edmonton Atheists, right here on 630 Chet. We're sitting down with the director of the Society of Edmonton Atheists, Luke Fevin. We've got a bunch of text messages coming into 630, 630. You can ask an atheist anything. Question from one listener, will you host Ask a Christian too? Remember, just last week, we spoke to Reverend Linda Hunter from Knox United Church for a good half hour. All perspectives are welcome on this show. Luke, to the questions, to the people. Dan says, I wish that people both in and out of the media would stop using the term Christianity in the same sentence as religion. Christianity is not a religion. Religion killed Jesus. Religion is more interested in the pomp and flash, the long sermons, the flowing robes. Christianity is having a personal relationship with Jesus and doing what he said. I agree with most of that. And? Great. You know, I uh, I think the more that we take uh, the system out of uh, personal belief, uh, the better. It's the system that is a large part of the damage uh, that religion causes. How do you view the Bible? How do you do? You believe that Jesus walked the earth and existed? I, I believe I, I believe that there was a man called Jesus. Um, uh, uh, as better than 50-50. I believe he probably lived. Uh, I don't believe that he is uh, the incarnation of a deity in any way, shape, or form. I think the, the Bible is an accidental and intentional uh, collection of stories and books uh, meant as a, a guide to life and intended to manipulate the masses. Another listener uh, says, Why is your guest so obsessed with God? If he believes he does not exist, I can't recall the last long-running debate about the tooth fairy. It so, kind of actually opens the door for me to ask you why these bus ads. Why spend your money? Uh, the design of the bus ad is impressive. You have, of course, the roof of the Sistine Chapel, the fingers touching, but God's been cut out while Adam remains. You ask in the ad, godless? Good. Why the ads? Um, well, first of all, the, there are a number of issues that atheism still suffers from a stigma uh, as well as a misunderstanding. So the first thing that we wanted to do was let um, atheists know that we're out there. It's okay to be atheist. It's okay to speak up, put your hand up. You can come out of the closet. It is okay to not believe in gods. Um, the, the second thing is atheism is, is misunderstood um, as being anti-religion uh, and a whole bunch of other things, but it's also misrepresented, sometimes I intentionally, I think, by the other side, that somehow we're immoral or we've got no grounding um, for, for, for morals. In, in fact, there was a study out of UBC uh, released late 2011 that said that the Christians uh, viewed athe atheists, they trusted atheists uh, on a similar level to the trust that they had for rapists. So, so clearly we have some marketing to be done. Um, the other thing is uh, the rights of the non-religious or the privilege of religion certainly needs to be discussed in our society. There's still lots of it, lots of it in our education system. And the last thing, of course, is we simply wanted to advertise that our group existed and, and to welcome everybody, people of faith, uh, um, non-faith, and those people that are just exploring. 
You can learn more about uh, what Luke and the Society does at edmontonatheists.ca. Uh, Will Muncie wants to know if atheists buy lunch for friends in New Sarepta. <laughs> they they do if there's a bottle of homemade wine. All right, there you have it. Uh, Tyler listening in from the West Side uh, wonders, does the universe have a beginning that requires a cause? And if so, what was this cause? I have no idea. Are there two, some questions that are too big to ask? No, there, there, there are no questions. The, the, the whole joy of being honest about what we know and what we don't know is, is we, we really get to, to, to get to grips with reality. And I think that's part of the frustration that some of us have um, with faith stories and the way they get jammed in is they get in the way of us honestly exploring the truth, the reality, and the crazy wonderment of this universe. There's an interesting comment here from Dennis. Not so much a question, but I'll ask for your response. He says, there are many atheists walking around, but pastors have told me they've never seen an atheist on a deathbed and doctors and nurses say they don't see atheists on their emergency operating tables. God bless you and your guest. That from Dennis. Well, this is not true. There's a basquillion um, examples of this lie. It's a myth that's perpetuated, along with there being no atheist in foxholes, um, which you can also debunk by going to atheistsinfoxholes.com. Um, so, yeah, it's just a myth. It's, uh, that's, it's not true. It's so do you, and, and let me then, I'll just read, read another comment here because it's along those same lines. And, and someone here asks if it's, you know, God will give this man a deathbed, says Lyle, where he will have time to question what it's all about. Do we just die like dogs? I can't believe that, says Lyle, who obviously doesn't believe that all dogs go to heaven. (laughs) But humans, many of us, have an innate need to believe that there's something more after this. And that's okay. I, I think that really is a large part of why we cling to religion. Ultimately, we have a fear of death. We have a fear that this amazing ride that we're on comes to an end, and we struggle to cope with that. And uh, so people people try and find something to cling on to, and that's okay. I, I, I understand why someone would, um, but saying that uh, life as an atheist is not you know, empty and meaningless, which is another one of these memes that's uh, put out there. It, it simply isn't. Uh, I and many others are more than okay with the fact that life is as it appears to be. We're born, we live, we die. We have this amazing experience at our disposal, and we make the most of it. I know that atheists can become polarizing figures in societies where religion seems to be paramount. People have many different conflicting views oftentimes, but it seems like the atheists get their own special brand of of vitriol (laughs) thrown your way. I was, that made me especially interested to hear about your monthly lunch date. Mm -hmm. There's someone you meet every month and it's not who most people might suspect it is. Yes, I um, I have a, a Baptist pastor uh, that I'm friends with. He's, he's a creationist. Uh, he's a creationist, um, and uh, we get together most uh, most months and have lunch in uh, in St Albert uh, High Surge, and uh, yeah, it's absolutely great. It's 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 a great example that you can disagree with someone absolutely and completely and still not mean that you can't be friends and you can't have a civil conversation. Justin wants me to ask you if you agree with Richard Dawkins when Dawkins states Christian education is child abuse. Uh, I believe, uh, yes. If if you're teaching children that if they don't do certain things, they are going to burn in in tortured pain for eternity, then yes, I believe that's child abuse. Okay, and uh, we'll give uh, Ty the last uh, question here. What if you're wrong? Then I'll be wrong, and we'll we'll sort it out. That's that's okay. I guess that's the other side of Pascal's wager, isn't it? Yeah, I do. I do I, Pascal's wager is it's not something I agree with, and we deal with that another day. But ultimately, I I'm just an evidence-driven guy. If I see evidence for a God, I will happily embrace the uh, the evidence-driven God. Um, that said, I'm kind of with Stephen Fry about how I might approach a conversation with him when I see him. I think he has a lot to answer for. 
Luke, thanks for making time for us today. Thanks. It was a pleasure, Ryan. Been an enlightening conversation. That's Luke Fevin. He's the director of the Society of Edmonton Atheists. You can learn more about what they do at edmontonatheists.ca. We're going to get to more of your comments following our discussion with Luke Fevin. He's the director of the Society for Edmonton Atheists. That, in just a moment, very polarizing discussion, but that's kind of the point. I want to make you think when you listen to this show question everything. That's the idea. Right now, though, you've heard it in the news, especially this year, fentanyl deaths on the rise in Alberta. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, in 2011, in the city of Edmonton, three deaths attributed to the powerful pain-killing drug, the illegal form of it, six deaths in Alberta. Three years later, 2014, 38 deaths in Edmonton, 120 across the province. You could very easily call it an epidemic. We're going to go to the source right now for more clarity on this. Dr. Mark Urema is the medical director of Alberta's Poison and Drug Information Service, also an emergency room doctor. Uh, Dr. Urema, thanks for making time for us this morning. My pleasure. Good morning. Good morning. To say the least, these numbers are concerning. From your perspective, I would imagine even more so because you're dealing with this on the front lines. Absolutely. The, um, I think the thing that's really important for people to, uh, to realize is that, uh, you know, while we think of fentanyl as a drug that we use as uh, an acute pain treatment for individuals with abdominal pain or fractures or those with uh, chronic cancer pain, this is not the medical fentanyl that we're referring to. This is referring to illicit fentanyl that's being made in illegal laboratories, and the two are very, very different. So typically when we're talking about what's prescribed by physicians like yourself to treat severe pain or to manage pain after surgery, this is the fentanyl manufactured by pharmaceutical companies. What are you encountering as this this illegally made fentanyl? What's the main difference? Well, the main difference, and it's the message we've been trying to get uh, through to individuals, is that you have absolutely no idea what you're getting into. What I mean by that is that the amount of fentanyl can vary from pill to pill, uh, as you know, these are often sold as fake oxy tablets, such as Greenies or Shady 80s or some of the street names. And one of the other things that we've been finding that's very disturbing is that there's actually veterinary drugs in some of these uh, fentanyl pills, and the drug in question is known as xylazine. This is actually a, a drug that is used to sedate large animals like horses and cattle for invasive surgery, and it has absolutely no use in humans. So to find this, in the blood and the urine of humans that have taken these fentanyl tablets is extremely concerning. Police have uh, suggested that they're seizing record amounts of fentanyl in communities around the province, including more than 88,000 tablets since last April. From your perspective on the healthcare side of things, are you seeing more cases involving this illegally made fentanyl than at any point before? Absolutely we are. So we're seeing many of these individuals show up in emergency departments and Sometimes they have to be admitted to the intensive care unit. But what's also concerning is the individuals that never present to hospitals. So these are individuals that are uh, either taking the drugs on the street or they're taking them back at home, and uh, they're doing it alone, so there's no one that's watching them. And because of what fentanyl can do in terms of making people unconscious or dropping their heart rate or their blood pressure, they're not able to call for help in time. So many of these deaths are occurring before they even reach a health care facility, and that's obviously very concerning. We're speaking with Dr. Mark Urema, the medical director of Alberta's Poison and Drug Information Service. Doctor, I know that many of our listeners are probably under the impression that the deaths here attributed to this illegal fentanyl are mostly deaths of, of street drug users. Uh, many of us will assume that these are deaths of homeless people, people that are on skid row, on the down and outs. Is that accurate, or is this impacting everybody? every element of our population? It's, that's a very good question, Ryan. The, the point is these drugs don't discriminate, and it does not mean that because these deaths are uh, occurring in, in particular populations that not everybody else is affected. Uh, we've seen in the news that these uh, drugs can affect kids that are uh, in, their, in their late teens or in their early 20s. These are individuals that are going to, going to school uh, that may actually hold down a job. Some may just be using it at parties. Um, It does not just affect uh, the individuals that people might consider drug addicts, although certainly those that uh, have 
a history of, of street drug abuse are affected, but that's simply not true that it's not affecting others. So, Doctor, I guess what it all comes down to is, is number one, obviously steer clear of illicit drugs. Like, that, that's probably the obvious statement. But if that's not the choice that people are making, what do people need to be especially vigilant about keeping an eye out for? So, first of all, the, the signs of, uh, of poisoning from, from fentanyl include things like very small pupils, uh, low heart rate, um, cold and clammy skin, uh, decreased respiratory rate and confusion to the point where people are unresponsive to pain. So if you see anybody behaving like that or anyone who appears unconscious or is having a seizure, we encourage either the user or those who are bystanders to call 911. Um, and the other thing is, is uh, just as a parent would talk to their kids about sex, drugs, or rock and roll, it's really important for parents to have that discussion with their kids so that they're not tempted the next time that they're, uh, that they're at a party. To put it in a, in a superhero perspective, uh, fentanyl is like kryptonite, and if people think that they're Superman, they should remember what happened to Superman when he came in contact with kryptonite. That's a great way to put it. Dr. Mark Urema, thanks for making time for us today. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Wow, there's a wake-up call. We'll be back with your comments. If you want to talk about what you just heard, sky's the limit. Go ahead. We'll revisit the atheism debate as well, prompted by Luke Fevin. He's the director of the Society for Edmonton Atheists, who joined us in the first half hour. Phone lines are open as well, 780-496-0063. In about 20 minutes' time, we'll sit down with Emmanuel Jal. He's a former child soldier, now an activist, an artist. We're lucky to have him here in the city of Edmonton. It's the John Humphrey Center for Peace and Human Rights that brought him here. It promises to be a captivating half hour the challenges, the obstacles, you can't even call them that. I mean, the absolutely devastating situations that Emmanuel has overcome to be here with us, to be delivering his message to thousands and thousands of people around the world. Absolutely amazing. Emmanuel Jell, right after the 10 o'clock news. We sat down with Luke Fevin. He's the director of the Society for Edmonton Atheists, right off the top of the show. And we want to get to your comments. You can call in if you'd like to share your thoughts, 780-496-0063. Doug, texted in to 630-630, says, Great conversation. Most religious beliefs are directed by family tradition, not directed by a god. As an atheist, I still love Christmas and Santa, etc. He says, People, let's try to be nicer to others. That's good. That from Doug. Justin says... Well, Justin's been saying a lot, and I I appreciate when people share from their heart. And there's some really passionate messages that we're receiving this morning. Says Justin, there's no such thing as an atheist. Everyone knows there's a God. The reason this gentleman denies this is because he suppresses the truth because of his unrighteousness. God has written his law on this man's heart and everyone else's. We are all created in the image of God. Your ideas have consequences. Your ideas lead to nihilism. Your leader, Richard Dawkins, thinks religion is a disease. That's the same line of thinking that Hitler had towards the Jews. That might be a bit of a stretch, Justin, but Justin's not alone in comparing atheists to Nazis, believe it or not, on our text line this morning. Another listener says, God, I love atheists. We must consider the dishonesty you feel when someone says there is no God. That's a dogmatic assertion. If he can't be sure about anything, how can he be sure there is no God? Well, I suppose that none of us can be sure about any of it, can we? I mean, I guess that's kind of the point. That's what faith is all about, isn't it? Topher says, if God is real, why are so many wars started over his legitimacy? I love how these religious nuts are so steadfast in their belief that they brush everything else aside like science and common sense. Oops, that last word is a bit of an urban legend, says Topher. Now, now much like the boogeyman in the tooth fairy, I say believe in whatever you want. Why spend money? Why not? Why spend money on those stupid flyers they stick in my door? Why spend money on commercials preaching the greatness of God? Take a look at the Catholic Church and the trouble they've been in. If that's what God is, no thanks. That from Topher. Dan says, I watched a documentary. I think it was called Earth from Space. It was not done by any Christian or religious group. It was done by scientists, and it's well worth watching. 
Earth from space. He says, in my opinion, nobody of intelligence can watch it all the way through and say that the universe was not created by someone of great power and intellect. Christians and atheists alike should watch that documentary. To a certain extent, you can understand the argument of it's impossible to see this from the perspective of a creationless or a lack of an intelligent design perspective. You can understand why some people would look at the Milky Way. Some people would look at, as we said earlier, the cardiovascular system or the way that the human brain or the human eye works or human innovation and suggest that there must be intelligent design. At the same time, others, you can understand why others on the flip side would suggest that without proof, I cannot believe. The Thomas perspective. A listener says science and religion are not mutually exclusive. Another says everyone should watch the God delusion. 780-496-0063. We'll get to your calls right after this break. We're having a great conversation following a discussion with Luke Fevin. He's the director of the Society for Edmonton Atheists. When you text in to 630-630, be sure to let me know your name. It's always nice to know who we're hearing from. One says, as a Christ follower, I find it interesting that a large percentage of the texts you've read out are also from Christ followers. It seems you have many such people who listen to Chad. You know, it's, it's interesting keeping an eye on this text line and, and not just on this debate, but on any debate to understand the cross-section of listeners. Right now, I would suggest that those that have been in touch this morning, it's probably about a 50-50 mix. And that's why I think it's important that we have these types of discussions. I never want to host a show where you only hear from one side. That's, you could never use the word conversation with a straight face. Brian says, I believe in concrete proof. So if God appears in front of me right now, then maybe you have my attention. But it will be proven that it's only a more advanced civilization, not a God. It is arrogant for us to believe anything less. These are the same people who believe we are alone in the universe this big. Kelly says, we live in a fallen world. That's why we all do things wrong, why we sin. He says, that's why the Catholic Church or other any organization is being pointed out. That's why we need a savior like Jesus. If I'm wrong, not a big deal. If you're wrong and don't believe, it will be very bad. We don't want that for you. That's why some people hand out flyers. And that's Pascal's wager, what Kelly says. If I'm wrong, no big deal. If you're wrong, you're going to burn in hell. Pascal's wager right? Might as well believe. Whether you actually legitimately believe or not, within Christian circles, they call that fire insurance. Brad says, I like what the guest said with regards to changing the negative stigma associated with atheism. I grew up unsure what I believed in, but I always felt that I had to believe in something. Dave says, I think Christianity provides hope and a support network for a lot of people. However, as an atheist myself, I find Christians tend to be either hypocrites and or uneducated on the history of the Bible. There's so much documentation on the plagiarism that's rampant throughout. Most of the main stories in the Bible have been taken from past cultures and religions, from the birthday of Jesus, the mother of Jesus being a virgin, the crucifixion and resurrection, the symbolism of the cross, Dave says, I'd be curious to know about Mr. Fevin's opinion on how to deal with Christians who quote the Bible as the premise to develop their ideology around things like GSAs. That from Dave. I should point out that you can get in touch with Luke anytime. He's a very active social media user. And you can find him on Twitter using the somewhat cheeky Twitter handle, according to Luke. Christians, I'm sure, will smirk at that. Lauren on Twitter says, I really enjoyed this segment with Luke Fevin this morning. No one dies in the name of God with his belief. Lewis says, as a Christian, I wish I had as much face as an atheist to believe in, rather to believe in absolutely nothing takes greater faith to believe in something. I applaud him, but I guess the only thing I can say is if he's wrong, then what? And again, this is, this is, it's interesting. It, it comes down to this argument time and time again. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? If you're wrong, then what? And that makes me wonder why 
are you a Christian? Why do you hold the beliefs you do so dearly? Just because you don't want to burn in hell? Is it, is it a fear factor that influences you to hold your religious belief? Or is it an adherence and a connection to the, the word of Christ or the teachings of, of Buddha or Allah or whatever your faith system is, whatever your beliefs are? Why do you believe? Just so you don't burn in hell? That sounds to me to be a, a somewhat of a cheap approach to it all, to be sort of a meaningless approach to it all. Do you eat kale because it's healthy or do you eat kale because you actually like the taste? Michael says, I'm a non-believer. Why? Well, humans are 200,000 years old. Most current religions are at most six to 7,000 years old. Any person who openly studies history knows that belief makes some people feel better because it fills in the gaps of not knowing and not understanding why things happen. It's all God's plan. Well, if it's God's plan that children get kidnapped and raped and murdered, then what kind of plan is that? And if that's not in the plan, then how did it happen? I have no issue with belief, but do not expect me to follow or respect your form of superstition. That from Michael. When we come back out of this newscast, this is an interview we've been looking forward to for weeks. Former South Sudanese child soldier turned activist and artist, Emmanuel Jell, live in studio.